So I wrote some software to control a robot, and by all means, not all the software involved with running the robot, just the uh, high level logic. Uh, the first issue I had when writing software for a robot was that I did not actually have the robot. And so the solution was to build an entire simulation environment, which looks a little bit something like this. So it starts up and what we have on the left is the sort of the world is programmed and on the right hand side is what the robot sees. And if you just release the parking brake and go into manual control, WASD, you drive our Mechanum robot around and then Q and E, the rotation. And you can see when the uh, robot's in range of the walls, it picks up the, uh, the walls with its time of flights. At the top, we have the uh, simulation of the LEDs and a little bit of debug output. And, and of course, you know, aim for 60 FPS. There we go. Uh, which is all great, but so how, how did we get here? So again, we have that, that programmed environment. So the, the starting point is the, uh, the world. So we go into the world folder and we have our, our world objects. And these are our barrels, our zones, our walls, uh, a lot of walls, our, our lines, things like that. And, you know, they have locations in the world and a bunch of geometry stuff about for distances and where things are and angles and things. And a lot of the, uh, the geometry underneath is powered by the Shapely library. Uh, and all of these go into form uh, when, when it's simulation, lots of world objects go into create a map. So we have all of our maps. So we have our start empty map, which is the one we just saw. It's just a, you know, a box with four walls. So we have those walls. And then to show the map and show the world, we have our world renderer. And, and this is now backed by Pygame for display and input. And you know, we do all our, our regular Pygame init stuff. And we have our big update loop where we, where we draw everything each frame, go through the sensors, show where sensors are, draw all the objects in the world, um, uh, plot, plot outlines of objects, all, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so, so that's sort of the starting point. Um, nothing actually moves as to that point. So we go to the controllers and then we have our, our simulated movement controller and this acts like the, uh, the wheels on the robot. So a few settings for, you know, simulating imprecise movement. Uh, and then we have, uh, basically a thread, which, uh, uh, uh yeah, every 120 times a second based on the velocity updates the position of the robot. And so some, some special math for combining the translation and rotation of the mechanism wheels correctly and some other stuff for doing the same thing for um, held objects. So if you're holding onto a barrel uh, and that's mostly, that's most of all of that. So that's the rendering. Um, of course, we saw in the simulation that we were seeing where walls were and that's down then to our simulated sensors. So what we were seeing just now was our simulated uh, time of flights, which are, I call it simulated line of sight for some reason. So this is sort of the specifications and it goes through and you know assigns the geometry of where it's looking. And then for every scan, we sort of align the, uh, the scanning zone with the current location of the robot that's there. And, and for each object in the world, see what, what does our field of view, which is a shapely thing, intersect with, uh, intersect with the object, right? And we just construct a list of those and return it back. And we do a very similar thing for a simulated 360 degree vision where we have uh, where we're looking and then, you know, what do we intersect with and, and copy it back. So that's pretty good. So what ties this all together in terms of actually moving things is the, uh, the robot brain. So like an autonomous part of the brain. So the, every brain shares some basics about itself. You know, lots of initialization stuff uh, for all its variables. You know, all the pulling sensors is the same between all the robots. So that's all handled in this base class and some, some of the, the low led level logic for the parking brake like that, the uh, low level logic for manual control, uh, timeouts, uh, safety stuff is all in here. Um, you know, checking for collisions, lots of stuff for the time of flights as well, some shared routines and that sort of stuff. And, and, and this basic brain on its own, that's enough for something like Pi Noon. Just a quick overview of the challenges we had to do. There's Pi Noon and Temple of Doom, which were purely remote control. Then we had Zombie Apocalypse, which was also remote control, but controlling an attachment. Then we have the four autonomous challenges, which I've tried to write software for. We had Escape Route, which was to navigate a maze. Then we had uh, Line Following, Lava Palava. Then we had Minesweeper, which was go to a lit up target location. And then we had Eco Disaster, which was to pick up objects and drop them off at a target location. There's also some other stuff in here for the uh, launcher, 
right? And so based on, on inputs it receives um, from the radio controller it to the attachment controller to, to do stuff for the launcher. Right, if we just flip back to the sensors, you know, for stepping into the real world, we have our real controller. And then, you know, this is talking over SBUS to uh, a remote control receiver. And, and handling its inputs and and those sorts of inputs go uh, and get processed in a big dictionary inside the brain. That kind of leads on to that this simulation software is also the control software. So depending on um, what mode you start in, different things get um, go past all the arguments. Different things get imported for different classes. So if you're in simulation, your uh, simulated movement controller gets in. Whereas if you are in control, you just have your movement controller instead of your simulated movement controller. And you can have sensor simulation where you have real hardware and fake sensors, and there's control simulation where you have fake hardware and real sensors and all sorts of stuff like that. And you know, create the basic stuff and go in this, again, initialization stuff depending on what modes you're in and eventually get to uh, you know a, a really boring regular loop, which is like, all right, here's you know control some LEDs and you know do, do logic things, you know, do the rendering. I think we already passed, you know, do the processing for the brain. And if there's any time left over for the target frame rate, you know, go to sleep. And sort of that's the basic framework for how everything works. Um, we can get into the challenges. So we do bash uh, challenges. And I think we'll look at escape route first. That's the first one I wrote. So we should see now the uh, release the parking brake. And so the robot goes and checks its alignment. And uh, so there's a little bit of custom logic here. And as soon as that forward facing time of flight sees a big gap, it knows the next thing it sees is that block in front. And then it executes what I call the squaring up routine where it uses the translation of the mechanic wheels to sort of align itself with the walls. And then it will go and it will just go left until it hits a wall. And then when it hits a certain distance, it'll slow down and then, then change direction and we'll go forwards and we go right. And then slow down again, it gets near the wall, go forwards again. Go left, and we can see the uh, the various program states being encoded in the LED. So as it changes direction, the LED is at lit or change, and so sort of now now it's done. There's nothing in front, uh, and so that's done, and so we can just quit out of that. And that was the first challenge I wrote. Um, so that was that was pretty early. Next, we have the sort of um, minesweeper challenge, which is probably one of the easiest challenges. Which is basically you know, release the park brake and just go for the red. So you just pass it the location of the red and it will it will head there. Um, and there's not really much much to this one. You can see again the, the LED is changing depending on what it's doing. Uh, and it will just go and, it, and the simulation will just keep doing that forever. Next up we have the lava palava and now now things start to get a little interesting because we're at the point where I started building multiple routines so we're in sim and we want the brain to be the original line following brain. And so this one uses the vision sensor and just kind of tries to look at the uh, this only the first little bit of the line right in front of it. And depending on what that is, sort of tilt itself around and try and keep that in the center of the line. And it kind of gets stuck in little feedback loops. And this really need to be tweaked had I had time to actually try running this on the real hardware. Uh, but in principle, this should have worked, but th this relies heavily on the vision system. So, so then I wrote a new brain that worked using the time of flight sensors instead. So now this one, um, is this running the right one? No, this is the... No, okay, yeah, this is running the right routine. So you can see it got near to the wall and it try it, it slowed down and stops and then it runs that alignment routine again and tries to center itself between the two and then it goes until there's something directly in front. And this nearly worked on the day except there was an issue with the uh, the motors and one of the cables was loose so it turned in an arc instead of a straight line and just kind of glid, uh, glided along the side of the wall instead of running properly at that point, which is a bit unfortunate. Uh, but also, I don't know if I would have had supreme confidence, um, in this routine. The real robot always sort of got stuck in that corner, uh, as we were running things. But in principle, that this could have worked using only time of flights. Uh, you know, 
that the alignment routine we did we did test once or twice in reality and it, it did seem to work reasonably well there's always a few degrees accuracy uh in it and then we come on to the bane of my existence eco disaster which i think uh in my mind is also kind of just a, a disaster let's go for eco disaster and we're gonna go for sim and we're gonna want the brain that is the original eco disaster brain I spent ages trying to get this to work. Uh, before we start, I've got programmed in um, sort of something pretty close to the actual challenge map for Eco Disaster. I'll explain why in a, uh, in a little bit. But we release the parking brake. It uh, goes, tries to uh, find the nearest, uh, find a barrel. And then it uses A star pathfinding to try and navigate its way back to the zone. But you can see it's kind of hicking up. Um, and I got as far as I felt I could reasonably do with this bef before I felt there are so many moving parts here that this will never work in, in, you know, with all the uncertainties of everything. So I actually gave up on this pretty early. So at this point, the, the program is sort of done. It doesn't actually have a thing to back it up and, and go find the next barrel. But it would have been really cool to just pass find around everything. What we ended up with instead was a, a simpler routine that didn't rely as heavily on the vision system and uh, on pathfinding, far more algorithmic, uh, which I called the cheese eco disaster brain, which relied on knowing the size of the arena in advance to work out the locations of the zones and use the time of flights then to, to localize. And so as long as you're only translating, you could kind of keep track of where you were and just sort of scoot along the sides to go and, and drop barrels off, right? And so you would just go drop things off and uh, sort of, I know this spot is free because I haven't dropped a thing off here previously. And then you you back up and you just, you know, there, there's no collision in the simulation between things. I have to, I'd have to program them separately. So just imagine that uh, the robot with its bumpers was pushing barrels out the way. But you just go and one by one collect all the barrels, you know, in between each barrel sort of re relocate, rehome yourself to this bottom left corner and then sort of run a scanning routine to find all the barrels. So so the reason why we had these sort of real life map programmed in is because on the day our, our vision system basically just wasn't ready. And so Considering I had all this flexibility programming about running in different modes, I thought, okay, maybe we can just hard code the location of the barrels and just pray that uh, that something would work. And we got a, a you know, you know, it was it was really close. I, so there, there was a moment there on the day I thought it was going to work, uh, but we took this uh, photo and I sort of tried to dewarp it in in an image program and tried to to get the picture to something that approximate a top-down view, put in the, the barrel location so we get a, a map that is the, um, the map that is like the real-ish map and we sort of all of these barrel locations sort of read off pixel locations in the picture, try and just try and estimate things. Uh, and just try and, and run the simulation like that. And unfortunately it didn't work, but I, I gave it my darndest, you know. I'm I'm pretty happy. I have this whole this whole kit and caboodle of, of a simulation environment, which hopefully you found it interesting. Hearing a little bit about how all this was put together, just a little post mortem here at the end as we as we finish editing things up. I just like to say thank you to my teammates. I know it was really hard working in different cities. You know, it was difficult to find motivation at times. You know, it's a, a four year old project we resurrected. I think we did a really good job overall. We got hardware working, you know, we got lots of different things integrated that all of us worked on independently and we, you know, put it all together on the day. And even though when we were trying challenges, you know, and it was pretty much the first time we'd actually tried doing any of these things in real life, I'm really pleased how we did. I think we did a great job. We learned a lot of stuff. I had a really good time. Thanks and thank you all for watching.